items. So here we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System virtual programs. Uh, we are a public library system in Maryland in the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C. We serve almost one million uh, Marylanders who border Washington, D.C. We have a huge, uh, fabulous uh, community here. Uh, very diverse, growing, booming, thriving, and uh, we are in the throes of this crazy time. And uh, the library is very uh, grateful for wonderful people like Jen who are willing to come on uh, to share their work with all of you virtually and keep us uh, engaged and connected in these strange times. Uh, so welcome, Jen. Thank you. This is actually great because I don't have to put on pants. I can just do this. <laughs> and, you know, if you know anything about me, I hate to wear pants. So this is wonderful. I mean, I love, I'm loving the, the Zoom life right now. <laughs> Very cool. Um, have you been a part of any uh, strange Zoom situations yet? I haven't. I, I've That's been good. pretty lucky that <laughs> I've heard some horror stories, yes. but I've I've been pretty lucky. I guess when you have a name called people I want to punch in the throat, nobody messes with you. So <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So um, I'm just going to share a bit of your bio with folks um, so that they can have a better sense of who you are and where you come from. Mm -hmm. um, Jen is the nationally bestselling author of People I Want to Punch in the Throat, which is based on her popular blog of the same name, which is really fun. I encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, she's also written for the Huffington Post, Scary Mommy, Nick Mom, Babble, Circle of Moms, and CNN Headline News, among many other platforms. Uh, her blog received a 2014 Bloggy Award for Best Parenting Web blog uh, and she lives in Overland Park, Kansas and is married to the Hubs and is the mother of two children whom she calls Gomer and Adolfa on her blog. She swears their real names are actually worse and we will get to that a little later in the program. Um, Jen has a really interesting and varied career as a writer and as a speaker and a uh, public figure and uh, she really represents uh, the the best of how um, creators and writers have um, utilize different platforms over the last 20 years or so um, in terms of reaching new audiences and engaging folks digitally and also through traditional publishing and then um, kind of the more entre entrepreneurial side of publishing in the book world. Um, so we're very excited to have you here. Um, can you tell us a bit about your origin story? Where did you grow up? Um, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have two hours? No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I right now I live in Kansas City. I live on the Kansas side. So anybody who knows Kansas City, we we have we straddle a border between two states and everybody always wants to know what side I live on. I live on the Kansas side, the good side. And um I've been here, I have to look at the date now. I've been here for 18 years. Um, we moved here right uh, around the time my husband and I got married. We've been living in New York City. He's from there. Um, but I spent my high school years here. I've kind of lived all over. I've lived in Iowa. I've lived in New Jersey. And so kind of just everywhere. But this was sort of the last place I lived before I went off to college. And my family was living here still. And when my husband and I started thinking about getting married and having kids, I was like, no, there's free babysitters if we go back to Kansas City. And so we moved back here about 18 years ago. And I've been here ever since. But um, when I first moved here, though, I was a realtor back in the day and I was doing real estate and I worked from home and I um, had a two-year-old I guess at that point and I was pregnant with my second child and that was right around when the recession hit the last time and my husband had been laid off from his job and so he decided he would work with me and he would come work we work together <laughs> and and I thought we would get divorced because couples oh. don't work together <laughs> this doesn't work out <laughs> And he was like, you know, you're going to have another baby and you need help. And who could help you more than me? And I was like, oh, my gosh. And so he came home, too. And, and we both started working together. And it was supposed to be temporary. He was supposed to find another job right away. But we didn't realize that the housing market was going to crash and everything was coming around the corner. And so instead, we ended up staying. <laughs> we stayed married. We stayed as realtors. Awesome. And then about um, 2011. Uh, came around and by now I had two small kids. I'm still trying to do real estate uh, out of my house I'm still trying to be a mom and a and a wife and all these things and I just kept going out and buying more underwear instead of doing laundry and <laughs> and I was just really really frustrated and And I felt really alone And so my husband had this idea that I should start a blog and that was sort of the the rise of the mommy blogs in 2011 just you know mm -hmm. everybody you know, his response was, everybody has one. You should go get one. <laughs> and I do have a degree in creative writing. 
um, I have just always used it to write things for other people. I had never, I was always gonna write a novel and I just didn't have time. I didn't know when I would write it exactly. And so I went out and I started looking at blogs. I, was, I had never heard of a blog, I didn't know what it was. And I went out and I looked around and I found a lot of, um, how do I put this nicely? I just found a lot of a, a bunch of liars out there, just a bunch of women telling me how great it is to raise children and cook dinner every night and clean their houses. And I just thought, no, that's that's the part I hate. <laughs> like, what mm -hmm. are you talking about? And so he, my husband, suggested I start the anti mom blog. And he said, you're going to tell the truth. You're going to say, you know, I love my husband, I love my kids, but sometimes I just want to run away. And um, and so he had the idea to call it people I want to punch in the throat. And I went out and I looked and sure enough, people I want to punch in throat dot com was available. And so I awesome. bought it. Yeah. right. <laughs> and so I bought it and I started blogging and I started blogging just sort of like whenever I felt like it. And I. I just I didn't have like a real path or anything. I'm sorry, this thing is making noises. I'm gonna turn that off there. I didn't have a real path of or goal of what I wanted. It was more just a place for me to sort of vent and I would feel better. Um, I'm a person who I like to complain a lot, and but I'm also a person who really finds humor in everything. And so my complaints are actually kind of funny. So it's like I have like these funny rants that I would do. And um and I started it in the spring of 2011, and then that December. I wrote about uh, the Elf on the Shelf, and that blog post went viral. I had 70 readers in those days, most of whom were related to me mm -hmm. or had gone to college with me. And when I wrote the Elf post, sort of the planets aligned and everything really, I don't, I still don't know exactly what happened, but something happened. And that blog post was read over a million times in 24 wow. hours. And that's really what launched everything for me. Um, I didn't know anything about social media in those days. And I learned that night how to, how to <laughs> social media. You know? I was still calling it the Twitter. Luckily, nice. in those days, it was really only like Facebook and Twitter. You know, there wasn't all this. Pinterest had just come into existence. Mm -hmm. and so um, I created a Pinterest account and I threw a picture out. I'd never put a picture on a blog before and I had to figure out how to do that so I could pin it on Pinterest. And um, and so I got about 17,000 people to follow me that night. Awesome. And, and that just sort of launched everything. I was sort of freaking out because I don't know if you've ever had a million people read anything you write, but it's kind of a very, um, oh, it's just, it's an, it's, it's a terribly awesome experience because you know, it's like you have all these people reading everything, but you're just like, it could have been better. Mm -hmm. And then I tend to focus on the negative comments. And so I was really upset that people were not understanding that it was a joke or whatever. And, um, but my husband was telling me, he's like, well, you have 17,000 people. Like you told me on our very first date, you want to be a writer. Like, what are you going to do tomorrow? Like feed this beast. It's time to get to work. And so I started blogging uh, five days a week at that point. I was still mm -hmm. working full time. And so I would stay up into the night and write my blog post. I'd push it out for the morning. I'd go to work. <laughs> I wow. do social media at night. And, um, and so now I've built it to over a million followers on social media and I don't know how many books at this point. And, and now I do this full time. And so that's, that's, great. that's kind of the origin of it all. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so how did the, the process work for going from blog to your first book? Yeah. So the process was kind of, um, it was interesting because I was blogging five days a week and I was building my, my uh, platform, my internet platform. And my readers were the ones who pushed me into a book. They kept saying, you know, if you ever wrote a book, I'd buy a book from you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, I don't know how to write a book. I'm barely writing a blog. And and because I do live in Kansas City, I'm a little bit more insulated from the publishing world. You know, I don't know. Now I know people who live here who are published authors. But in those days, I didn't know anybody who who was a published author. I didn't know agents. I didn't know how to find a publisher. Or, mm -hmm. You know, I was a huge reader. And of course, I'd heard of publishing companies and I knew you had to have an agent, but I didn't know how to find one of those people. And um, but around that same time was the rise of, of internet publishing, of, of self-publishing on Amazon and, and other platforms. And so my husband, again, the genius behind everything that I do, <laughs> he said, um, you figure out how to write a book and I'm going to figure out how to self publish a book awesome. because we felt like at that point we were coming up on like the one year anniversary of going viral. And I just felt like my iron was probably going to get cool if I didn't strike quickly. And I knew I, the research I'd done, I knew that it would take 
you know, it could take years for me to query and find an agent and find an editor. And, and I just thought, gosh, you know, I have all these people. Cause I think at that point, maybe I had 50,000 followers, you know, and I thought, and in my mind, I thought every single one of those people would buy the book. <laughs> so I was huh. like, oh, I'll sell 50,000 books. I might even sell more because some people could buy two and give it as a gift. Mm -hmm. And I have since learned that is not the case. <laughs> oh. the time, that was sort of my thought process. And so um, so he learned how to self pub or yeah, he learned how to self publish and I learned how to write and and write a book. And then we we came together in uh, I think October of the following year of 2012, and we put it out on on all the platforms that, where you could self publish it, and we made it available to libraries. Like I went to my local library, and I was like, "Would you carry this book?" Which is kind of a you know I know sometimes libraries are a little iffy about self pub books, so I don't know how your library system is, but ours was ours was pretty okay with it. They took it, they were yeah. nice to me. But I know that sometimes um, there you guys are like very inundated with the self published authors in town. And um, but then the book actually went to the top of the charts on Amazon. It did sell quite a few copies. Mm -hmm. And when it sold so many copies, that's when I was able to attract the attention of an agent and find a book deal with Penguin Random House. Mm -hmm. And so now I kind of keep a foot in both worlds. Very cool. Um, so with, with the origin story in mind that you just shared, um, what is the like? the elevator pitch for your ethos behind all of this, because it is not just about the platform anymore. It is about um, kind of a set of values that you are um, helping people find in themselves, I think, in some uh -huh. some sense, or how would you phrase it? Um, well, I think the, the, the common thing I hear a lot is that I say what everybody else is thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I, I try to speak up. I know that I'm in a, I'm in a very um, unique and lucky position in that, I don't give a hoot. <laughs> um, I use the F bomb like commas, and so I'm trying to be very, <laughs> very good tonight for the library. So, you know, I am in a position where I really don't care what people think of me. I don't mm -hmm. have an employer, I don't have a boss that I have to worry about. And so I can say the things that maybe other people are not in a position to be able to say. I try to call out. I try to call out bad behavior when I see it mm -hmm. and I in myself and in everybody else. And, um, and I try to make sure that everybody, my other thing I think is I try to make sure everybody laughs. I want to make sure that you're laughing. It's not always that we're laughing at other people. I think it's mm -hmm. really important to laugh at yourself and to see, you know, a lot of times what I write about, it's like, I'm making fun of this thing, but then it's like, Oh shoot, I do that too. Like we all do that. Mm -hmm. And because I think that right now we all take ourselves so seriously, especially the older we get, like we just are so serious about ourselves and we can't laugh at ourselves anymore. And I think that that's crazy. And so that's always my goal too, is to make, make you laugh and make you think a little bit. Cool. Um, we could use more of that in the nation's yeah. capital. It's It's been <laughs> rough times for a while around here. <laughs> it's everywhere, but yes. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah, there's no one who can take a joke these days. Yeah, I know. It's... um. Hopefully it'll change a little bit. I think uh, this new environment of folks having to adapt to to kind of this a new format of interacting with each other just for the sake of staying alive and that kind of thing has really um, at least removed some of the the formalities or the um, posturing that happens in social interaction. Right, and I think but people it's... are being very real right now too. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other thing is that you know I try not to um, I try not to be phony and I you know I try to let you like you know, the people who know me and who have always known me are just like, you're just the same as you are. Like I can like literally hear you telling me the stories when you read, you know, when I read your books or whatever. And, and I think that's the other thing too, is like, I think a lot of it, people are being very honest about how they feel right now, mm -hmm. um, good or bad, but you know, we're really seeing everybody's true sides. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and backgrounds. <laughs> yeah. <yes>. yeah. <laughs> um, so, what has the journey been like uh, with navigating both uh, the traditional behemoth publisher world and then having your own imprint as a as a company? Yeah, you know, I think for me, I like I, I like to keep a foot in both worlds. I think that um, for it's very slow to work with New York when you're mm -hmm. self publishing. I could literally, you know, I can take as much time or as little time as I need. You know, I I, I teach whole 
courses about self-publishing where I talk about that you need to have an editor, you need to have a proofreader, you need to have a cover artist. But some, but a lot of people are like, I don't need any of that. And they could literally publish it today in 24 hours if they wanted to. No one's stopping you from doing mm -hmm. that. And which is an amazing thing, but also though, there's a lot of junk out there too because of that. And so I try to really treat my self-publishing side as a business and really try to put out really quality content. Um, and what I look at is I know that my self-publishing stuff is, I can do it much faster. It still takes me several months, but I can do it much faster than like New York. For instance, you know, I'm working on a new book right now for Penguin Random House um, called Midlife Bites. And that book, like we signed the contract almost a year ago. It's not even due until July. Mm -hmm. So it won't even be out till 2021 at the soonest, you know? And so, and so sometimes that can frustrate me a little bit because I am used to working at a much faster pace because I do, because I do spend so much time on the internet and so much of my um, content and like sales are, are dependent upon that. It's like, I just know that like I'm constantly feeding it and I'm constantly trying to keep it hot, you know, and, and to think like, Oh, I got to do this for a whole year and promote this book for mm -hmm. a whole year before it ever even hits the shelf. And no, everyone will be sick of hearing about it by then. And so that's the part sometimes it can be frustrating about traditionally published. But then the thing about self publishing is that you have no help. It's just you all by yourself and you have no idea, you know, you have no idea telling you that this is a good idea, that this is a waste of time. You know? And so you can just put whatever you want out there. And so the way I have to look at it is, you know, when I have an idea for a book, I have to decide, is this a book that I want to, that, that, that New York would even be interested in? That's the other thing, you know, they only want like, big sellers. They want something that they can, you know, they're spending a lot of money to promote it. They're spending a lot of money to buy it. Lots of people are going to touch it before it goes out there. And so it's going to be expensive for them. And so they want a book that's going to sell a lot. And a lot of my books, sometimes, you know, I might have an idea that's a smaller, you know, won't take up as much shelf space, or it doesn't have a shelf even at a traditional bookstore or something like that. And so I think to myself, well, this might actually be a better one for me to just keep in myself and do it myself. Mm -hmm. Because I make, you know, I make money traditionally published on my advance, but with self-publishing, you make money every time you sell a book. And so it's like, I have to kind of weigh and figure out which one's going to make me more money and which one I think is going to be the better, which is the better path for each book individually. Cool. Um, with, with the, the, the different types of projects that you have, um, do you adapt the writing style or has your writing style evolved over the course of your career? Yeah, I would like to think so. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you could be a genius from the get-go. That's that's yeah, totally no, cool. Just, you know, it's funny you said that because since we've been in the quarantine, um, I have a private group on Facebook uh, for my readers. It's it's called No Pants Required. You can join me, find me. But um, during the quarantine, I decided that I would read to them either blog posts or chapters from my books. You know, something I would read read to them every week, and so. What I've been reading sometimes are like, I try to go back and I try to read the more popular blog posts and I feel like, okay, well this was, you know, people like this one, so I'll read it. And some of them are like, at this point, you know, they're like 10 years old, some of them. <laughs> you know? And I'm reading it and I'm kind of cringing. I'm like, oh, I need to rewrite this one. <laughs> you know? um, so yes, I think it's gotten, I think I have gotten to be better. And I think too, what has changed too is my attitude has changed as I've aged, I think I've, and, you know, in some ways, the internet is kind of a cesspool. You know, you see sort of awful stuff all day long, and you're inundated with trolls and people fighting. But for me, I have curated such a community that um, I actually have become like a kinder, gentler person from the internet. Like I have actually developed more empathy than I've ever had. And, you know, and I actually hear people's stories. You know, we talk about living in our bubbles and stuff because I, and I am definitely in a bubble. I work from home in my office. Like this is, this is it. This is my whole day right here. You know, I don't leave. And, and so to go on the internet and to hear people's stories and to talk to them and to hear their points of view and that kind of thing, like it's actually made me like kinder and gentler. And so in that regard, I think I've changed my style a lot. I'm not near as harsh as I used to be. Cool. Um, so with 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 your books, I think um, I, I would I would pose the question of who who is your target audience. But before I, I ask you to answer that, um, I would also say that um, the 
the target audience questions like reading habits are crazy, right? So sometimes we get stuck in our the genres that we're used to, that we're comfortable with, or we're you know swayed by certain cover artwork. Um, your books in the bits, the snippets that I've read, and then also in the blog posts, they're for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sometimes uh, folks uh, reading cover blurbs or like hearing about the background of an author might not dive into something because they think it's a, for a certain uh, yeah. audience. So are, how do you approach that audience question? Yeah, so because I came out of the mom blog sphere and I wasn't even like a real true mommy blogger either because I really don't write much about my kids. And especially once my son hit like fifth grade, he asked me to stop writing about him. He's now 15. I haven't, I mean, I think some people probably think I gave him up for adoption or something. Cause like I never talked okay. about him because, because he's just, he's super shy. And I say that there's only three people in my world that get to have a veto power and it's my two kids and my husband. And so when he asked me to stop, I stopped. Whereas my daughter, she would have a whole book about her if I do it. And, and, um, and so the mommy blog thing kind of put me into like, into um, like a genre shelf space. That's why I kind of, you know, that's why I won like the parenting blog of the, you know, award and that kind of thing. And parenting is definitely a lot about what I write. And parenting is something that is very, you know, near and dear to me. But I also write about politics and pop culture and feminism and, you know, and all kinds of things. And so, and, you know, pants and bras and <laughs> whatever I feel like writing about. And, and so I think it's funny because, yeah, a lot of times I get kind of pegged as like a mom writer or a female writer or, you know, middle age. My new book is all about middle age. And so I'm definitely going to get pegged into that group. But, mm -hmm. you know, but I am now. I'm 48. So I'm middle aged. And, and right what you know. But I think it's funny because a lot of times when I speak to groups, um, there'll be men that will come up to me and they'll say, I'm going to buy this for my wife. And I'll say, uh, you should read it first. Yeah. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> and then you should give it to your wife. Like you guys should read it together. And I do, I would say the, the bulk of my audience are female mm -hmm. and the bulk are between the ages of 30 to 55. And they like to laugh and they're usually snarky and sweary. And so they like me, but I do have several men who read me and and like me. Just this week, I got an email from a man who told me that he'd passed my books numerous times in the bookstore and never really thought about it. He thought about it, but he just was like, nah, I don't know. And then this week, he's like, I had nothing better to do. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And so he's like, so I downloaded it onto my phone. And what do you know? You're hilarious. You know, where have I been? And so I think that's the thing. Like anybody who wants to laugh and who needs a laugh, I'm your girl. Like that's I'm the great. one for you. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, have you ever uh, considered, uh, and this, uh, this is not intended as a leading question or placing values on how you approach this, but um, have you ever considered adapting your work for like a teen audience or for like a children's audience or for, um, for dads, like how to relate yeah. to moms or something like that? Right. You know, I have, I have thought about doing, um, I, you know, I've thought about the dads thing, but the thing is, you know, there's plenty of dads out there that can write and they should write their own experience. It shouldn't be me telling them about what it's like to be a dad. So I'll let them do that. As far as teens and young adults, yes, I did write. I have a fiction book called My Lame Life that I wrote a few years ago, and it's a YA, um, but it's very people I want to punch in their throat, but for uh -huh. teenagers, you know, nice. I wrote it for my daughter. My daughter wanted a book that she wanted in the past. I've never let my kids read people. I want to punch in throat books because I am a totally different person at home than I am in the book. Like around them, I was like, you know, um, you know, I don't cuss and, and all these things. And so, and I was writing a lot about people that they knew and I knew that they would like, help me, you know, because I changed everybody's names, but I know they'd uh -huh. be like, oh, I remember when that happened. That was, you know, Mrs. So-and-so. <laughs> <You know? That's laughs> <funny. laughs> and so I didn't let them read it. And so when she was probably, I don't know, maybe in fifth grade or something like that, she asked me if I would write a book that she could read. And so I wrote My my Lame Life and, and it's the first in a series. And, um, and so, and it is adapted, you know, it is sort of people I want to punch the throat, but it's, it's fiction and it's for younger, a younger audience, but it's the same idea of, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny and it's heartwarming. It's got all, it hits all the notes that I normally hit. Cool. Um, so I'm curious to hear about how you craft the, um, the comedic moments in your writing. Uh, and I'm guessing probably that it's just natural, uh, all, all across the board. Um, 
but interesting hearing about what, how you approach that and then also how you do the comedic moments differently between um, a, a book chapter or a book and then a social media post because they can be right. hugely different. Right. So, yeah. So a few years ago, I was asked to teach a class on writing humor. And I thought, you can't teach people to write humor. You're just, <laughs> you're just funny or you're not. <laughs> and so I started doing some research and I found out that there are um, there are actual techniques and I just happened to do those and I just didn't realize so like for instance one of the things is um they want you to lead with the joke at the at the top usually mm -hmm. a lot of times like Dave Barry and those guys all lead with the joke whereas I end with the joke I like to have I like to have a thousand words leading you into the joke and then mm -hmm. I end it on a punch at the end and so it's just kind of different and I found out that um, I think it was last year maybe or something um back when we could still travel I I was I was invited to LA to go on the um the, on a podcast for um, for the comedy store, and they asked me, they were like, you know, how did you learn how to do the left hook? And I'm like, I don't know what the left hook is, like or the left turn or something they called it. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And they're like, well, you lead us this way, and then you, you know. And I was like, oh, do I do that? Is that a thing? Okay. <laughs> so, so it's like, so some of it is just I have always been kind of a funny person. Um, you know, I think for me, I try to see the funny in everything. Like, I, what is it like? You know, time time plus pain equals humor or something like that you know right. like you can always go back and see the funny in in something um and you know i just I, I try to usually what happens though like my process is usually i write the story first and then i go back in and i funny it up like i just mm -hmm. you know i add more detail or I add more backstory or you know a lot of things i use another technique i use a lot is like alliteration because alliteration is funny and you know and so i just try to think of like um, weird ways to say things like phrasing. I think there's certain words that are funnier than other words. And so it's like phrasing and thinking of different, uh, I use, I use Google a lot for, you know, what's another word for blah. And then that way I can find a funnier word and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And then as far as like social media versus chapters and that kind of thing, a lot of times what happens is, um, because everything I write is nonfiction, it all is true. It's all happened already. And so, so what will happen is like something will happen to me and like I have, um, you know, I have like a whole like notepad here of just like ideas of, you know, I write them all down. I'll say like, tell that story, tell this story. And what I have to do is once I think about writing those stories down, I have to decide, is it a blog post? Is it a social media post? Or is it a chapter in a book? And part of it is, is how good is the story? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, is it just a little quick, you know, hey, you guys, I just smacked myself in the face putting on my bra this morning. Ha ha ha. You know, that's like a social media post. You know, I can't tell a whole story about that unless I got stuck <laughs> in, a, in a in a dressing room in Macy's or something. And, you know, and they had to call the fire department. Then it's a story. And so I have to kind of figure out. And, and the blog it's shorter it's still a story but it's it's a shorter story a chapter in a book needs to be you know several thousand words and if i don't have enough for that then it goes on to the blog post and sometimes you know i have to decide too like when i'm writing a book i make a list of all the stories i want to tell in the book and then i some of them i i realize later as i'm writing i'm like you know what this is not really a chapter but i'm going to save this and when the book comes out i'm going to use this as a blog post to promote that book Great. And so um, that's sort of how I'm always thinking. And I don't use Twitter because I there's too I I'm too wordy for Twitter, and so nothing goes on Twitter. <laughs> gotcha, cool. Um, so where did your writing chops come from? Was it just kind of you teaching yourself, or did you study writing at all in school? Yeah. So I've been writing since I was a kid. Like I've always been that kid that kind of had a notebook that she scribbled in and told uh -huh. stories. I've always been a storyteller, and I think that's the difference. I don't really feel like. I'm an author sometimes. I feel more like I'm a storyteller. Um, I I have always been someone who can tell you a really good story as we sit down to talk, you know, and I can, and that's how I write. That's how I think when I'm writing. I, you know, I have like a plaque here over my desk that says like, tell a good story and make it funny, you know, and that's kind right. of what I always am always thinking about. Um, and I did go to college to study creative writing and I did not have a very good experience with that though mm -hmm. I had a professor who really did not like my style and um and so that's why at one point um I dedicated a book to him because you know that's what I do <laughs> <laughs> nothing like spite did <laughs> really you send it to them motivates me so <laughs> but um 
I and and in college, I really thought I'd be like I, my vision was to be Donna Tart. I wanted to put a book out every ten years that everybody would study, and everybody would be like, "What did she mean by the blue curtains?" You know, and <laughs> and I'd be like, "Only I know," and. Um, and instead, I end up being Irma Bombeck with F bombs, which has been amazing, though. Like this Great. is really what I was meant to do, and so I think it's just a matter of figuring out uh, not so much the chops, but just figuring playing to my strengths. Like this is this is who I am. I'm never going to be Donna Tartt. Like it's just not my thing. I, I, God bless her; she's amazing. But that is not how I can write. Then mm -hmm. that won't be my that won't be my claim to fame. Cool. So what are your reading habits like? Are they similar to like the style that you write in or do you just veer off in totally different directions? I veer off in totally different directions. I mean, really, honestly, before I started writing nonfiction humor, I didn't even know that was a category. <laughs> like, I didn't even know that was a genre. I was like, oh, wait, because I still remember it was um, Jen Lancaster's book. It's called uh, Bitter is the New Black. And I read that book. And right around the time when I first started blogging, I read that book and I was like, wait a minute, you can tell a whole, you can write a whole book of just stories of you being a dummy. Like I could mm -hmm. do that. And so, um, but I find that if I read other humor writers, I kind of, I don't copy them, but I just, I start to, I start to uh, sort of, oh, I copy them. I mean, I just like, <laughs> I, like I, their voice just like kind of like my voice is very strong. And then all of a sudden my voice is like their voice. I'm like, what the hell just happened here? And so if I, especially if I'm writing a book, I can't read other nonfiction mm -hmm. humor. Um, but right now I'm reading, I read a lot of YA. I mm -hmm. love YA and I have two teenagers. And so um, I like to, so like whatever they tell me to read, I read so that I can talk cool. to them about books. Cause I uh -huh. just, you know, I'm like, what are we reading? So we just finished uh, one of us is lying. Um, and now I'm reading The Silent Patient. I like all oh, those so you know, murder mysteries. Yes, yeah. You know, who done it, you know, unreliable narrators. I mean, all that kind of stuff. And then I love a lot of historical fiction. And I mm -hmm. like I read a lot of regular nonfiction, not so much humor, but just mm -hmm. nonfiction. I love nonfiction. So I am just if someone I have several trusted friends who are mostly librarians and whatever nice. books they recommend, those are the books I read. Very cool. Um, how far along in Silent Patient are you? Oh, like chapter two. Oh, hold on for the ride. It's, <laughs> I don't know how much you've heard about it yet, but. <laughs> I'm just worried. That's what I've heard. Like, yeah, yeah don't spoil it. Woo! <laughs> yeah. And it, yes, yeah. And uh, YA is super cool too. We have a, a reader's advisory event tomorrow night uh, focusing on YA with three of our librarians, which will be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, reading is awesome. And I think the, 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 the genres that you've described to me makes sense why you read those things because your your writing is about real life and all these different types of stories and ways of telling stories are different pathways into different things that we deal with um and then what you do in your writing is an expression of that to reach people and that's super cool i think um and i and i i don't quite get the people who stick to just one thing like i've got my six things that I stick to, but just one is a little too niche. Well, and for me, it's like, and I guess that's the other thing too, like, you know, for, for authors, like that's why I don't look at other authors as my competition or, if, you know, because it's like readers read all kinds of books mm -hmm. and they're not going to just stick with one genre. And so that's why I feel like, you know, if someone who I trust who knows me well and, and knows my reading habits and is like, you need to take a chance on this, you know, I don't know, whatever, this crazy book set in space and it's an, you know, and it's a epic retelling of Henry the Eighth. I'd be like, okay, I'll read it. <laughs> you know, like if you say it's good, yeah. I'll do it. So I'm I think reading is the best way to learn about new things that you maybe would never know about. So yeah. why not? Totally. I have a, a good friend who's an author who um started introducing me to some new new to me authors uh over the last few years and every single book that he recommends to me like he has totally figured me out and everything that he he sends my way is a home run and like i'm totally enraptured it's, it's delightful yeah. and, even, and even though it's not just one genre or anything cool um so what has been like a really surprising response to one of your pieces whether a book or a blog something that was just like totally out of left field whether it was the person or the type of person or the comment I think, um, well, I mean, obviously, I think the biggest surprise was sort of going viral with a post about my elf on the shelf. I mean, that really, I, I, I have so many people that ask me how to go viral, and there are formulas out there. But and again, it was when it kind of like 
writing humor. I, I followed the formula, but I didn't realize I'd followed the formula. Mm -hmm. And and when I try to follow the formula again, it doesn't work as well. <laughs> you still got to have that luck, you know, go with it. And um, and so I think the biggest that was a huge surprise to see that and to see how many people it it resonated with, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of felt like I was the only person. I think that's the main thing I see a lot. There are posts that I'll write, especially on my blog. There are things that I will write and I will think I'm the only person feeling this way. And then I will have so many responses from other, usually women who will tell me like, oh my God, me too. Um, you know, this, the book I'm writing right now, the Midlife Bites book, it actually came out of a viral blog post too, because about a year ago, I was, I was turning 47 and I don't know what happened, like 40, 45, everything was fine. And then 47, just, I was like, oh my God, I'm so oh. old. And I was like, what have I done with my life? Like I have not accomplished half the things I wanted to do. Like what is even happening right now? And, and so I wrote this blog post and it's not funny. It's just like me just sort of like, I think I was crying when I wrote it. I mean, it was just this really like raw emotional thing, but I was like, am I the only one who feels this way? And it was like this overwhelming response from people. And my editor at Random House read it and she was like, uh, girl, this is your book. Like this wow. is the next thing you need to write about because clearly people want to talk about this and nobody's mm -hmm. talking about it. Um, and so I think that probably, to hear from people who I felt like had their lives together, like, cause that was my thing was I felt like, gosh, you know, I haven't done anything. I haven't accomplished enough. I haven't, I want more. Is that bad that I want more? I mean, all these things, you know, are my kids going to be good adults? You know, my, you know, my son's going off to college in four years and I don't think he's ready. I think I have, I've messed him up. I mean, you know, all these things that I wouldn't normally talk about and didn't feel until all of a sudden, and to have these other women and men come to me say, Oh my God, me too. And I was like, really? Mm -hmm. You look like you have your life together. <laughs> you know? And so I think that was surprising to see, to hear from so many people who I thought really had it figured out who also don't have it figured mm -hmm. out. Cool. Um, what has been your experience of kind of witnessing the community uh, come together around your work and the, the space and the dialogues that your work has, has uh, facilitated for folks? Like when, when, was, when did you start to see that being a thing? Um, you know, I think probably very early on, like as soon as it went viral and I started building the community, um, you know, part of why I think I'm so invested in my community is because of the response that I get from them. I get the most honest and heartfelt email emails from them. You know, I hear from people who tell me that they read my books while they're going through chemotherapy. And, wow. you know, I've met people at book signings who come up to me crying and tell me that they read this they've read my books while you know their child was dying you know i mean just like really tough tough i mean it's like for a for a humor group <laughs> we've, mm -hmm. we're going through a lot of tough things and i realized that a lot of people were turning to humor because their lives were so tough you know and part of why I started writing was because I felt alone and then to hear how many of them feel alone. And so right away I could tell that there was like something like special about my group. And then as we've grown over the years, it's like, they're just, they're usually, I mean, we fight, don't get me wrong. There's some fights in our, in our comment section and that kind of thing. But there's also such a, um, there's just an outpouring of like, of help like they're always willing to help each other and they're always willing to like lift each other up and and so i think that is what makes them really really special and so and that's what makes it worth it you know to me because it's like this is a job like i spend half my day writing and half my day with my community and if they weren't fun and and rewarding i wouldn't be there you know mm -hmm. so so i'm glad that they're 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 really cool cool does your husband still work in real estate he does. Nice. He does. Yep. Very cool. Cool. Um, does do you miss that life at all? Or are you just kind of glad it's glad it happened, but glad it's not now anymore? Yeah, you know, real estate probably. I mean, I've been I actually wrote a book called Working with People. I'm a bunch of throat that went through all the horrible jobs that I've had in my life. And real estate was the last one before this. And this is the job I wanted since I was five. But if cool. I didn't get this job, I would I'd still be in real estate. Real mm -hmm. estate probably was the best of both worlds for me. I could work with who I, I, I don't work well with um I don't work well with like bosses and like meetings where we just have meetings to plan other meetings mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, <laughs> you know, and like your three, three, you know, 360 review where you have to like, you know, my five things I want to work on this year. Like I was like, Oh, I can't be bothered. Yeah. And so, 
real estate was actually a good fit for me because I could be independent, I could do my thing, I could go out and find my clients. I love houses, I love helping people buy houses, you know, and sell their houses. Um, but yeah, after a while, when the writing thing really seemed like it could be a thing where I could actually like, you know, make enough to live on, I was like, oh, I wanna do this, this is what I wanna do. So I don't really miss real estate, but um, I, I'm, I'm glad I did it and I would go back in a heartbeat if I had to. Cool. So it sounds like you're one of the, the fortunate folks who has reached their dream kind of nirvana with, in terms of work and passion. And that's really awesome. I think many of us in the library world um, have fortunately arrived at that same place because you kind of have to love this in order to do libraries. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quirky yeah. thing, um, but we really enjoy it. Um, so how are you kind of tackling COVID in your work? <laughs> <laughs> well... For one thing, not a lot of work is getting done during COVID. Uh -huh. um, my brain is like a tepid bowl of oatmeal right now. Like I can't really focus to write. Um, like I said, my book is due in July. I had a call with my editor about oh, a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. <laughs> like I just don't know. And she was like, I understand, I understand, you know. Um, there is a chapter in there about COVID though, because I felt like at this point it sort of tinges everything. Like, you know, as I try to write about ways to you know self-help or something like that and i'm like it's all covid now um so it, it sort of has its mark on everything that i'm writing and it's definitely but then on the flip side you know i just wrote an uh, an op-ed here in kansas city for a publication here about how that that i'm taking it very seriously but yet i'm still gonna make jokes and mm -hmm. so so i'm using i mean there's a ton of dark COVID humor out there that I am loving. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I am like all over that, like trying to make light of it and make us laugh. Um, you know, and then when now with the murder bees or the murder hornets, whatever oh, they yeah. are, you know, and I'm like, I mean, I just, you can't, if we made, if I wrote this book, people would call me a liar, know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I'm just trying to find the humor anywhere I can and make people laugh because it's really, people are struggling with a lot right now between fear of losing their jobs, you know, being stuck at home, fear of getting sick, losing loved ones. I mean, all these things. And so I'm just trying to make people laugh every day and COVID believe it or not can be funny. Cool. Um, so I'm going to invite folks to start asking us questions. Uh, if you type them into the chat box or into the ask a question prompt there on the bottom of your screen, if you're watching on Crowdcast, then we'll uh, share those questions with Jen. Um, also, if you're watching on the other platforms, you can share your questions right on those, and then I will uh, be checking those regularly. Um, one question came up earlier, uh, which you've kind of touched upon in relation to uh, your son, uh, but are there topics that are off limits for you in your writing? Yes. Um, right. So he's off limits right now by his choice. And, um, and part of that's part of why I changed their names. Um, you know, that's why I called them Gomer and Adolfa. When I first started writing and I went viral, they were only three and five and people actually threatened to come and steal them from me and told me, I, yeah, told me I was like a bad mother and oh. you know, all this kind of stuff. And so it kind of scared me. And so I've never put pictures of them up. I've never put their real names up. Um, and they're the only ones I, I don't talk about. There's There have been some, I would guess I would call them like political topics that I have not touched over the years just because I don't, I, the people who, the, my readers know how I feel about those topics and I know how they feel and I don't need to attract the trolls and, mm -hmm. and get doxxed or whatever. And so so there's a few things like that, But but then again, in the last few years, I kind of threw all that out. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, um, so I guess the only thing I really want, I mean, it's more like personal stuff, I guess I want to talk about, like, no one's ever seen my house, no one knows mm -hmm. really where I live, um, no one's really seen my husband even, or, or knows his real name, so it's that kind of thing, or I try to keep my personal life, I'm pretty much an open book until I'm not, I have very hard boundaries, and I enforce those boundaries, and my readers are really great to, like, creep right up to the edge, and then mm -hmm. stop. And I appreciate that. Um, and so that's, that's those are about the only topics, though. Cool. Uh, we have another question now, and it is, do you ever have writer's block? All the time. Um, yeah, I do. And a lot of times, especially with it being uh, nonfiction when I'm writing, 
I'm always trying to think of like, I'm like going back in the past, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking like, what's something that was funny that happened to me when I was eight that I can talk about? You know, someone told me last night that they have, um, they found poetry that they wrote when they were like 14. I'm like, God, I wish I had poetry from when I was 14. That would be amazing to like make fun of. Um, and so a lot of times what I'm trying to do though, I find that writing, the more you write, even if it's just crap and junk, and that's why it's good for me to have like the blog and social media and all these things, because I'm constantly writing something and it will kind of jog me. I write down a lot. I have notebooks everywhere, all over my house. And I have, um, something called shower, shower notes, aqua notes, aqua notes. Oh, wow. That's and cool. Aqua notes are like the greatest thing ever. They're waterproof notes that go in your shower. Cause I get the best ideas in the shower. So if I'm blocked, I go take a shower and, <laughs> and I will, or I read or I take a break. I'm really, I'm, I'm really good at taking breaks. <laughs> like, but I won't just sit there and like agonize over it. I'll kind of go do something different. Cause a lot of times when you're doing something else, it will jog you. And so that's why I try to keep notebooks and stuff everywhere because once it jogs me, I can write it down and be like, tell that story about that one time you did that thing. And, and then I can go back later and write the story. Very cool. Um, so before we keep going to questions, uh, I would love for you to share what the best URL is for where people can buy your books from you. And we'll get that up on the, the screen here as well. Thank you. Yeah, you can get, um, well, you can get my books anywhere you buy books. Um, and then if you would like to get a signed copy of my book, though, um, you can always order them through my website, which is people I want to punch in the throat dot com. But punch. all your you, and if your library doesn't have it, you can always request it. And usually they will go, especially if a patron requests it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we have uh, your first book in our uh, ebook catalog. And so it's available right. on there. Yep, and so folks can start putting holds. And if anyone's interested in the library purchasing the other books, please go ahead and do that submission form. Uh, we would appreciate it. Yes, there are many. I'm gonna <laughs> order my own signed copies as well. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, very cool. So that uh, the link to Jen's uh, website is in the green icon at the bottom of the screen here. It says buy Jen's books. If you click that, it'll go right to her page where you can do the direct purchase. Um, and then if you would like to request uh, the purchase through the library, please go to pgcmls.info and we'll take care of that. Um, and the, uh, the first book is checked out so folks can get in the hold queue for that uh, on the eBooks, which is really great. Okay, next question. How has your husband handled your success? He is he handled it pretty well. He is a very good sport in that um, he's super helpful. Like I keep saying, you know, every time I say something happened, I'm like, and then my husband did this because he really does. Like he, I am the one who, um, I'm the one, now I'm pretty confident, but when I first started, I was not confident at all. And I did not think that any of this would work out. And he was the one who was constantly like, you've got this, like, go for it, do it. And so he's always, he's my wingman. <laughs> um, I wrote a book called How I F and Did It. And it's all about like the different ways that you can become a blogger or a, a writer, you know, whatever you want to do. And there's a chapter in there that talks about how you need a wingman. And he is my wingman. Like he, awesome. he is always like the guy, he, he gets the audience primed for me. <laughs> you know, <he's> like, <laughs> and he's very excited for me. Um, but then again, he also keeps me very humble. Cause like if I get to be too big for my britches, he will definitely <laughs> let me know that I am not all that <laughs> and I need to calm down. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so he's done, he's done a really good job and he's really good sport. Like I know a lot of times I write about him and I throw him under the bus a lot. And that's probably a lot of the mail I get from other men. They'll be upset mm. that I attacked my husband in that manner. And I would like to just go on the record. I always try to make sure everyone understands every bad story I tell about him is him reminding me. He's the one saying like, oh, mm. tell the story when I got you a scale for your first Mother's Day. And I'm like, oh, that was horrible. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you know, and, was, and so like he is like, he is, he is happy to be the butt of the jokes, which is a rare thing, so. Very cool, sounds like a great partnership. Yeah. Um, do your children write as well is the next question. I wish. No, they're both really good writers. Like every time, you know, you have the parent teacher conferences and the English teachers are like, they're really good writers. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, neither one of them have any interest in writing. They both, neither one really like English. I mean, they break my heart every day. They are both science and math nerds and I don't even know what to do with them. Like they bring me, like right now this whole like online learning thing, you know, my daughter had some, I don't know, some math work that she didn't understand. I was like, dude, like go to YouTube. Like I am worthless. I can't help you with no. this. 
So, um, so they're both, I think they'll both grow up to be like engineers or something like that. Cause they have no desire. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. We need them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's great. It's just, yeah. it, but I'm like, if, cause I look at it for me, like, I mean, when I was 13, like my daughter's 13 now and I was like, God, you know, if my mom could have like helped me self publish a book and like, you know, promoted it, you know, like, I'm like, we could get you like going. And she's just like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Very cool. Um, so the the world is crazy right now, <laughs> as I know you cover in your your work. Um, where where do you think comedy is most successful in bringing folks together despite ide ideological differences in times like these? Well, I think we can all laugh at the idiots, but um, no, <laughs> I know that's what works for me. Um, I think that you know comedy that's the tough part about humor and comedy and all that is that it is it's very subjective and so that's why i always say you have to find your people you have to find your own audience there is there is somebody out there who everybody will find funny i am probably you know i am not everybody's cup of tea and i get that and i don't try to be your cup of tea if you get me you get me and if you don't that's fine but i encourage you to find someone else who will make you laugh because we all need to laugh and um, and I'm always, I say we have to punch up rather than punch down. Um, that was something that Chris Rock has said before. And I, and when he said it, I was like, that's, yes, that's genius. You know, meaning that you, you're always picking on someone who's, who is above, you know, you're not picking on people who are already down. And so I don't find that funny at all. And, and so I think that's the other thing maybe that we could possibly all agree on is that we should always be punching up rather than down. Um, although I think there's a lot of people out there who would not agree with me. <laughs> and then those are not my people. Like, I'm not <laughs> so, cool. but, uh, but yeah, I think that's what we can all agree on is that we can all make fun of idiots. We just all have different definitions of who the idiot is. Cool. Yeah. And everyone, everyone deserves to be made fun of in a, in some sense, I think it, yeah. and it's especially beneficial if, if it's, if you as an individual can um, kind of find the self-deprecation too, like for me, I like that. Self-deprecation is always good. Yeah. Like self-deprecation is the easiest way to go because nobody can be mad at you for making fun of yourself. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Although, um, but they can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have any fond memories or, or moments uh, of your interacting with libraries and librarians beyond the friends who have had many good book recs? I do. In fact, so I grew up, my, my formative years were spent in New Jersey in a town called Morristown, New Jersey. Oh, wow. And, and there was a library there that we could walk to from school. After school, we walk, we would walk to the library and we would do our homework there and we'd hang out there. And, and I, and I just remember there was tons of programming that my parents would bring me to, you know, just everything happened around that library kind of thing. And it was a very cool building and it was, just, it was just really awesome. And when I moved away, I, I missed it, obviously, you know, and that kind of thing. And then this year, they always do a, um, like a, I don't know what you would call it, like a kind of like a, they have like a big book signing with all these authors that come in and they do little talks and stuff and you can buy their books and it's sponsored by the library. And this year, my friend and I went to it as like attendees, um, you know, as readers. And it was so cool to be back in that building again and be like, oh, oh cool. you know, I was like, I remember this. And then I think as a self-published author, you know, because I started out self-published rather than traditional, libraries, especially the libraries that I've come into contact with, have always been such a champion for me and my books. Um, because it's kind of hard to get a self-published book into a traditional bookstore mm -hmm. because they don't think that it's the same um, level as a traditionally published book. And so, but libraries are like, they would read it, librarians would read it, and they'd be like, yeah. I'll take it, I'll stock it, I'll put this on our shelves. And the thing about librarians versus like a bookseller say, is librarians are not so worried about what's the new hot release and what do I need to move? They're worried about what does this patron want and how mm -hmm. can I match them together? And so they're always so good to like recommend me and bring me new readers. And so that is also something that is very special to me about libraries. I travel all over the country speaking at libraries um, because they are, so 
they're so important to the communities and they're so important to authors and to readers and they just do. And I know you guys do a lot more than just books, but for me, it's all about the books. And so I, I think that libraries will always hold a very special spot in my heart. Totally. And um, on that point about uh, the book thing, um, I think where we are really similar in the the kind of overall scope of what we do is that you're creating community ultimately through your books, even though that you know it's a business proposition for you and a and a, and a way of life. Um, but for us, whether it's books, the online, or anything else, it's all about creating that community too and uh, evolving the way that we support that community, especially in times like these where we're getting to have fabulous authors uh, with us who don't have to travel here, which makes it easier for everyone, I think. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna do a last call for questions. If anyone has any, please type them into the chat. Thanks for the great questions that came out. We have had a lot of uh, positive comments on here, folks who are looking forward to checking out your books. Uh, my last question will be, um, where would you recommend someone who is a new reader to your work uh, to start? Is it your first book or the blog or something new? Yeah, I think I would start with my blog, which is people I want to punch in through .com. Start there, read a little bit. If you like my style and you like what I have to say, then I think it just sort of depends. Um, like this is this is probably my bestseller, and this one's all about like suburbia and raising kids and that kind of thing. Um, this one's all like holidays. This one has the Elf in the Shelf post, but the Elf in the Shelf post is still on the blog too. If you ever wanted to read that, and then this is the one about jobs. This is the one I always say like if you're a guy and you think like oh I don't want to read like mom stuff like this is all the work stuff. The guys like this book. <laughs> So, <laughs> nice. you know, so I think it kind of depends on what your what your mood is, what you're looking for. But um, start on the blog, and if you like me and you like my voice, then yeah, find something good for you. Very I got cool. for everybody. Awesome. Well, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for connecting with us, Jen, and for uh, sharing some time with us uh, away from your family. I know it's a lot, lot for folks to ask of that uh, for, from authors now, um, but we, we're grateful to having you with us and we look forward to um, keeping in touch with you and would love to hear when your next books come out so that we can bring you back to, to the community here in, in Maryland. Um, this has been a lot of fun and we wish you all the best. I really appreciate you doing this. I was supposed to be there all last week and I was really bummed. I didn't take anything off my calendar because I just like to, I like to rub salt in the wound and be like, oh, I'm supposed to be, oh. yeah, I'm supposed to be in DC tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm so glad you guys were able to make this work out and I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. It was a great time. Totally. Awesome. Likewise. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And um, thanks to those who have been watching on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This video will be on demand on all those platforms for anyone. So please share it out with your networks um, and share the information about Jen's books. And we will see you all next time uh, with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System.